In a typical city or town, on a typical residential street, we find a typical home occupied by a typical American family. Like millions of his fellow Americans, John Q. Public earns enough money to keep up the payments on a new car. He takes great pride in owning a fine, new, long-term mortgaged home that was built to last a lifetime. Mrs. John Q. Public no longer finds housework fatiguing drudgery thanks to a host of labor-saving devices, including her husband. Mr. John Q., because of a 40-hour week, has the leisure to dream about his favorite sport. Darling! Oftentimes, in a secluded corner of his private den, John Q. reflects on some of the better things he has done with his life. Insurance to protect his family if he is called before his time. Money in a savings account for emergencies, for summer vacations, and to help put John Q. Jr. through college. In spite of the high cost of being a husband and father, John Q. has a private little nest egg. His practical nature tells him it ought to do more than collect moths. Uh, let's see, where did I put this thing? I know it's... Mm -hmm. Common stock. Do I own any? I don't even know what they are. Mm-hmm. In that case, it might be a good idea to get a little information. Let's start with a fellow who owns and operates a company that makes and sells oil drums. Each year, customers buy more and more from our friend because he makes a better oil drum than his competitors. One day, customers demand more oil drums than the owner can produce. He'll have to build a larger plant. So he decides to form a corporation to sell shares in his business to raise the capital he needs. First, the owner goes to the state government to get a corporation charter and permit to sell shares in this business. Next, our friend goes to an investment banker and shows him the record of the oil drum manufacturing company's past performance and plans for expansion. The investment banker decides to help our friend sell shares in the corporation to raise the $3 million. However, before any shares in the corporation can be sold, certain information must be filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission in Washington. The investment banker and the owner must swear that the information they file contains nothing but the truth. Registration with the SEC does not imply that the government approves the stock issue as a good investment, but only assures the public that if any of the material statements about the stock issue are false, punishment will be according to the law. After SEC registration is effective, the investment banker pays the owner $3 million in exchange for a certain number of shares in the oil drum manufacturing corporation. The investment banker sells shares of the common stock to people at a price which returns his $3 million investment and shows a profit for his services in selling the stock. Money received from the sale of shares in the business builds a new and better plant which produces more and better oil drums. The people who bought the common stock own proportionate shares in the corporation's plant, tools, equipment, and all of its assets. Common stockholders elect the directors of the corporation. Directors represent the stockholders and are responsible for the way the business is run. Directors determine the amount of dividends, if any, to be paid out of earnings to the stockholders. Naturally, when stockholders invest in a business, they hope to receive dividends to help pay for necessities of life. Within a few short years, an increasing demand for the company's product poses another problem for our friend. How can he fill all the orders? 
he will have to build more plants and buy more tools to increase production of oil drums. It will take about $20 million to do the job. One way to get this additional capital is to sell more stock to many more people. So the Oil Drum Manufacturing Corporation votes to send its president to the New York Stock Exchange to see if their common stock can qualify for listing. The corporation wants to list its securities on the exchange so that the additional stock they need to sell will be more attractive to investors all over the nation. Securities listed on the New York Stock Exchange can be sold for cash any time in this national marketplace. Each year, many corporations inquire about listing their securities, but only those which can pass a thorough examination as to their financial health are accepted. Calling the president of the Oil Drum Manufacturing Corporation. Calling the president of the Oil Drum Manufacturing Corporation. Report to examination room B. Attention all members of the stock list department. Report to examination room B. The stock list department examines the qualifications of corporations seeking to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. The corporation must have substantial assets in plants, tools, equipment, and cash. There must be a broad distribution of its shares among a large number of stockholders. The corporation must show successful management and sales records and annual net earnings at the time of listing of at least $1 million. The proposed stock issue must meet federal, state, and New York Stock Exchange regulations. The corporation must agree to report to its stockholders at frequent intervals. If the examination by the stock list department indicates the corporation meets minimum requirements of the exchange at the time of the examination, the corporation's application for listing is recommended. The Board of Governors of the New York Stock Exchange finally approves the application and sees that it is made public. Extra, extra, read all about it. Now that the Oil Drum Manufacturing Corporation's stock is listed, its name is abbreviated for use on the ticker tape. Each time ODM stock or any other stock listed on the exchange is bought or sold, the ticker tape flashes all over the nation the price and number of shares traded. A buyer in Colorado wants to purchase some ODM stock. The buyer's broker in Colorado sees that the last ODM transaction was at $10 a share. The buyer could buy from 1 to 99 shares, which would be known as an odd lot. But our Colorado friend decides to invest in 100 shares known as a round lot. The Colorado broker wires the order to his New York office. The buy order is telephoned to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. It is given to the firm's floor partner who becomes the representative of the buyer in Colorado. The floor partner goes to the post where ODM stock is traded. The representative of the buyer in Colorado bids $10 a share for 100 shares. But at the moment, there is no stock offered for sale at this price. In the meantime, however, in Maine, an ODM stockholder who needs cash decides to sell his 100 shares if he can get $10 a share. The Maine broker wires the sell order to his firm's representative on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. This firm's floor partner, representing the seller in Maine, offers to sell 100 shares of ODM stock at $10 a share. The price of $10 a share is mutually acceptable and the transaction is made. Like the cowboy in Colorado and the fisherman in Maine, investors all over the country use the facilities of brokers who are members of the New York Stock Exchange whenever they want to buy or sell stock of companies listed on this national market. Yesterday's savings financed the miraculous growth of our railroads, automobiles, airplanes, farm machinery, 
communications, electric light and power, textiles, and countless other industries contributing to a more enjoyable life. If a part of our savings continue to flow into industry, American labor, management, and capital can continue to build new tools and plants. Industrial expansion creates jobs for hundreds of thousands of young people who must find employment each year. A growing capacity to produce things which make life better in peacetime can be our greatest protection in time of war. When danger threatens, we can convert industry to produce the things we need to defend ourselves. Common stock investments have helped to make our country prosperous and powerful. Owning a share in American industry is like owning a share in the future of our nation. But remember John Q. There is a risk as well as an advantage in owning any kind of property. So get the facts before you put your money to work. People in tent because their economy was growing naturally. There was and the money went far enough so that the average person could live comfortably. War. The war forced higher taxes in order to buy the equipment they needed to fight successfully. The government soon found out, however, that even these higher taxes were not enough to pay for the equipment it needed. And so, after borrowing what it could from the people's savings, the government of paradise had to borrow more and more money from the banks in order to buy. Finally, the war was over. Only following the war, there was a shortage of consumer goods due to the fact that the nation had not been producing them during the war. Naturally, the prices of these things increased because of the higher demand and continuing shortages. Then the young men of paradise came home and found themselves jobs again and found themselves wives and settled down in homes, lots and lots of homes, which resulted in great new suburbs being built and began raising children and still more children. And pretty soon these youngsters needed more schools and classrooms than the nation had ever needed before. All of this was to the good, of course. The new families needed cars and bigger homes as families grew and more appliances and more goods, services of all kinds. Eventually, even though production was climbing, with all those jobs and homes and cars and kids and appliances and suburbs and so on and so forth, there was an upward spiral of wages and prices. And beneath the surface of what looked like prosperity was this new enemy, the enemy of inflation. The people couldn't see him or recognize him for what he was, but they certainly felt the consequences. Although these consequences took many painful forms, they all came down to this. Money wouldn't buy as much. The pay was higher than ever before, but it bought less food, clothing, and shelter than ever before. You can be certain this made the housewife and all her family very unhappy. And the only thing a raise in pay could do was to help a family keep up with the higher cost of living. The businessmen and the merchants found that their costs, too, were rising faster than before. And the result was prices began to rise again. And so the cost of living kept on creeping higher and higher, and the value of money kept on slipping lower and lower. And the enemy within kept on getting fatter and fatter. The older citizens and the others on fixed incomes were the hardest hit of all. Since their incomes couldn't possibly buy what they'd originally planned. Along with everyone else, these folks were in trouble. Meanwhile, the government was having almost as much trouble as the citizens. 
You recall that while the war had still been going on, the government had to borrow the money to buy the arms and ammunitions needed to win the war. So the country had a tremendous load of debt to carry and to pay interest on. But what was worse was that the end of the war had not meant the end of the need for arms and ammunitions. Far from it. Even though they continued to live in harmony with their nearest neighbors, the government had to maintain defenses big enough to discourage unfriendly nations from attacking. And these defensive arms also cost a lot of money. Higher taxes could have paid for all of this, but taxes were already at an all-time high. The government didn't want to ask for more taxes. And for that matter, people didn't want to pay them either. And so, the government borrowed still more money to pay for defense. First, the government tried to borrow the money from the people, for this was money already in existence and would not have increased inflation. But when it had borrowed all it could from the people, the government began to borrow money from the banks again. This had an effect similar to printing more money. And the enemy within kept getting fatter and more greedy all the time. Since prices had been rising all along the line, the government had to pay higher prices for goods it bought and for the services it supplied. This spiral of increasing costs helped to a vicious circle. Then, too, the owners of all those new cars we mentioned began to crowd the highways and ask the government for more better roads. The parents of the kids wanted more schools for their youngsters. So the pressure was put on the government all along the line from every segment of the population. More goods, more services, more financial assistance, more government support, more special consideration. And at every new request, the government had to face this difficult decision, to refuse a request or to grant the request, and then to raise taxes once again or to borrow more money. And so the government, being a collection of human beings, just like you, and you, and you, and you, and me too, usually decided to borrow more money, because that seemed to hurt nobody, and to make everybody happy. But it didn't make everybody happy, because when the government put that extra, it was only too obvious, only too soon, that there was more money to buy things, than there were things to buy with the money in circulation. If the good people of paradise had saved the extra money so their savings could have been invested to increase production, they might very well have broken the vicious spiral of inflation. But being human beings, just like you and you and you and you and me too, they took their extra cash into the stores and marketplaces and competed with their neighbors for the goods and services that were available. And you know what that will do to the price of things. And it did. Prices went up and up and up. And wages followed them up and up and up. And the enemy within became bigger and fatter than ever before. And the whole thing started all over again. But don't underestimate the citizens of paradise. They're no fools. They sat down together and examined the entire situation from every possible angle. They finally recognized their enemy, and they tied him down. They put a stop to inflation the only way it could be stopped, by the people themselves. Here's how they did it. First, they demanded that the government live within its means, just as a family has to live within its means. This, of course, meant refusing to expand such services as could possibly be delayed until after the inflation crisis was passed. Unless the people were willing to do this, they would have to pay for any additional services they wanted by agreeing to increase their own taxes. The people didn't like this idea at first because taxes were so high, but they had to admit it made a lot of sense. So they stopped asking for services and benefits they weren't willing to pay for as they went along. People agreed to ask for increased wages only as justified by increased productivity. 
and manufacturers and businessmen agreed to share the benefits of increased productivity with the consumer by offering greater values. Housewives and heads of families shopped more carefully than they ever had before and persistently sought out the best possible value they could get in any product or item. With everybody working together to lick this problem, they immobilized the enemy. The value of their money began to level off instead of dropping constantly until it finally stabilized itself at a sensible level. The cost of living also leveled off again and folks had confidence in the future and began saving more of their money instead of speculating on inflation. Not only did it make them feel secure, but these savings provided the capital to increase production. We thought you ought to know of the method used by the people of paradise to solve their problem of inflation, because you might happen to know of some similar situation sometime. If you do happen to come across such a situation, here are the symptoms by which you can recognize it. Prices and wages will be at an all-time high. And although taxes will be at an all-time high, government will be living beyond its income. And there still will be a demand for more government services. Each segment of the population will be blaming every other segment of the population for the situation. And finally, and most important of all, money will be steadily losing its value. If you should run across such a situation, you might tell the good citizens of that country how the problem was solved by the good citizens of the Republic of Paradise. Bounded by Graustark in the north, Ruritania in the south, the Sea of Hope on the east, and on the west by the Ocean of Tranquility. Sorry, lad. Baby, I quit. Sales and profits down fully. Huh? Own business. All you need's a little cap. And a decent hat in the entire village. And such prices. Imagine paying that much for a poke bonnet. Why, it was an awful thing. Why not? Women's hats. My own business. <laughs> Fortunately, Jonathan was... Well, the cost of the building took care of the nest egg. And there was nothing left to pay for the necessary tools and equipment. But happily, Jonathan had a good reputation. And, as his idea promised a profit, his friends and neighbors were willing to invest some of their savings in his new business. of time, an enterprising chap showed up with the raw materials to make hats. And before long, Jonathan was open for business. First, he had to advertise. Shop at Bonton, it's the spot. Twelve new hat styles, that's a lot. Ladies, get that new hat drill. Thirty days to pay your bill. Superior style and quality of his pocket. He set a price for his creations that the consumer was willing to pay. And sales poured in from satisfied customers. Jonathan had big dreams of the wonderful reward in business for himself. But before he could buy what he wanted, his employees' wages had paid. He had to pay taxes. And his friends who helped finance the business had to be paid a return on their investment. When all of his bills were paid, Jonathan had to exchange his big dream for a little dream. Mesdames, mademoiselles, it is the privilege of Alphonse, hat stylist to all the crowned heads of Europe, to bring you hats with style so chic, a quality magnifique, and a price, ooh la la, so low. Come one, come all, grand opening. To meet competition, Jonathan had to plot. If 
customers approved the quality, style, and price of Jonathan's new designs, he still could make his dreams come true. With the passing years, this strong foundation of freedoms protected the dignity of the individual and his family, gave everyone the right to worship as he promised anyone with ability and enterprise, the opportunity to participate in the building of the American way of life as we know it today. A way of life that depends upon millions of thrifty Americans who send a portion of their savings to work in our business system each year. People from all walks of life, workers, farmers, housewives, all of us, dollars to work in our business system in the hope of earning dividends or interest on our investment. Anyone who has an insurance policy, a bank deposit, or a share of stock is helping to finance by the land, the buildings, the tools and equipment, and create new job opportunities for our expanding population. The goods we produce are distributed to main streets all over the country. Today doesn't look much like the main street of Jonathan's time, the principles of our business system remain the same. Still compete with one another for the consumer's supply of spendable dollars. And Mrs. Consumer is still mighty critical of everything she buys. Uh-oh, competition. The management of every business has a continuing problem to improve their product to stay ahead of competition or else. Jill's got the ball. We've got to get it back. Give them that new product play. More style, better quality, new features, and at the right price. Hit the line, men. Let's go. Micrometer. Wrench. File. In addition to creating a better product, management develops new tools and more efficient methods. Workers turn out more boxes to sell at a price Mrs. Consumer will pay. about this better product are advertised to point out its competitive advantages. The so magic permafreeze with plenty of room for groceries stored. The auto magic permafreeze with the super duper store a man door. Just press the button for your ice, a feature that is new and extra space all over the place for other items too. In the auto magic permafreeze, so see your dealer right away. Get a permafreeze today. Ah, yeah, lady. Permafreeze is your kind of refrigerator. High, high quality at a low, low price. Sales dollars from satisfied customers once again flow back to permafreeze. A successful business must have enough sales dollars coming in to enable management to pay the expenses of doing salaries and wages, materials and supplies, research and product development, plant maintenance and repair. In addition to all of these bills, management has to pay taxes to local, state and federal governments. Any money that profit. Wise manage plows part of it back into the business. The remainder of the profit paid out as dividends. These dividends are sacked 
to investors as a reward for risky... Although occasionally some of us pick a lemon and have to take a loss. The constant investment of our savings through good times and bad has enabled our competitive business system to continue to increase the production of more and better goods to meet the demand and for a better standard of living. For example, the inefficient tools to help him turn out a product. Low production meant low wages. In 1900, many men had to work 10 hours a day, six days a week, enough money to provide their families with the bare essentials. Hand labor was the rule in the home as well as the factory. In many families, the youngsters had to work to add their earnings to the family budget and forego the opportunity to get an education. And with most families in those days, the standard of living left to be desired. A half century rested enough in our business system to provide the average worker with efficient and expensive buildings and machinery to enable him to produce enough in a 40-hour week as the 1900 worker earned in a 60-hour week. This shorter work week gives us all more leisure time to enjoy a standard of living beyond the wildest anyone who lived a half century ago. The more we earn, the more our families have to spend for the things they need and want. Young people today have leisure time for fun and enjoy educational opportunities denied their fathers and grandfathers. And fortunately, we have been able to raise our standard of living without sacrificing the spiritual side of life, which means so much to the American family. Our business system has continued to provide a better life for our increasing population. In spite of destructive forces, which have pounded against our foundation of freedoms with no avail. However, wars, or the threat of wars, interrupt the normal operations of our competitive system. And may result in government controls which crack essential blocks in our foundation of freedoms. In World War II, wages were controlled. Many workers were frozen to their jobs. Farm prices were controlled. And profits of business were limited. Raw materials were allocated between essential and non-essential business. On Main Street, USA, many of us found less to buy because a good portion of our productive capacity went to the war effort. Prices were fixed and the available supply of goods was rationed. In war emergencies, we allow government to risk. But we Americans have learned to remove government controls as quickly as possible and to repair the blocks and the foundation of our freedoms to allow our business system to resume its normal operations. While we invest part of our savings to help finance the world's most efficient business system, at the same time we pay taxes to government to finance many kinds of services which also contribute to our way of For example, our taxes must provide necessary funds to improve and expand our school system. Our taxes must be sufficient to pay for city streets, health, fire, and police protection, and of course, aid to the needy. Our state taxes help pay for highways, educational institutions, and among other things, help to finance important experiments to increase the productivity of our farms. Our federal taxes pay for irrigation and reclamation projects, for national parks, postal services, the Weather Bureau, and many other services. Our taxes have to pay for the enormous cost of past wars and provide the funds for a defense program which will ensure the safety of our country. In addition, all of us should be willing to pay whatever taxes are necessary to enable efficient government 
to improve or expand any essential service. But with our present tax load, we should avoid pressuring government for any new services that aren't absolutely necessary. Because we all know the more our government provides, the more taxes it's forced to collect. None of us can escape. Big business. All business. Farmers. Workers. Housewives and all of us have to pay our share. Demanding more and more from government could create a tax burden heavy enough to crack essential blocks in the foundation of our business system. Therefore, we shouldn't let our taxes reach a point where they destroy our ability to save and invest. For, as we have seen, our rising standard of living depends upon a constant flow of savings dollars into our business system each year. In the future of our country, waves of destructive forces will continue to batter against our foundation. When any force weakens the interlocked blocks of our political and economic freedoms, as good citizens, we must be quick to use and repair any cracks that may appeal the foundation of our business system strong. We shall be able to maintain and improve the way of life our forefathers conceived and established. A way of life which gave everyone who came to this country the chance to progress according to its Like the youth of yesterday, the young people of today deserve the same opportunity to earn success and accomplishment. And on this found... Once upon a time, not so very long ago, there was a young boy named Joseph who decided one beautiful morning that this was the day he would go out into the world and seek his fortune. That's not what I'm going to do at all. You got it all wrong. Oh? Well then, what is it you've decided to do this beautiful morning? It sure isn't to go out and seek my fortune. That sounds corny. Well then, perhaps you'll tell me where you are going for goodies. Look, mister, you know where I'm going this beautiful morning. And I know where I'm going this beautiful morning. So why don't you stop with that wagon full of goodies bit? I just thought if we eased into the subject a little more gracefully... You know something? That's the trouble with a lot of people like you in the world today. Instead of getting right to the point, you spend too much time being graceful. Now, if you'll excuse me, I better get going to where you already knew I was going anyway. You won't mind, then, if I make an occasional observation? Why should I mind? You're the voice of a narrator. You've got your job to do, and I've got mine. I'll try to be as unobtrusive as possible. Here he comes now. Hi, Hi Joey. Hi, sorry I'm late, but I got tied up in a conversation with a voiceover narrator. The what? Never mind. Hey, Joey, what you got in the wagon? That's what I want to talk to you and Daisy about, Jr. I got a proposition for you. What kind of proposition? We're going into the fudge business. You, me, and Jr. So that's what's in them boxes. Right. For every box you and Daisy sell, you get to keep 20 cents. How much do we sell it for? Fifty cents. Wait a minute. That means you get back ten cents more than we do. So? So how come you get more than we do? Yeah, Joey, how come? I'll tell you how come. Whose idea is it? Yours, but. And whose candy is it? Yours, but. Who gets stuck with it if you don't sell any? You do, but you see. He's got a point, Daisy. Of course I got a point. It's what's called free enterprise. Free enterprise? What's that? If you'll pardon me, Joseph, maybe I can be of some help. Who's he? That's the voice of a narrator I told you about. How come we can't see him? Because you never see a voice of a narrator, you just hear him. Nevertheless, to answer your question, Daisy and J.R., free enterprise is the freedom of private business to organize and operate for profit in a competitive system without interference by government beyond regulation necessary to protect the public interest and keep the national economy in balance. Just had to be a show-off, didn't you? <laughs> Forgive me, Joseph. But as you said before, 
we both have a job to do. So if right now you'll just go about your job of organizing your fudge selling operation, I'll go about my job of explaining the free enterprise system. Be my guest. Thank you. Now then, in order to better understand what we've come to know as the free enterprise system, let's first examine some of its principal components. The fudge is called the product. Joey owns the fudge, so he's called the owner. And since he made the fudge, with the help of his mother, he's also the manufacturer. J.R. and Daisy are, in a sense, working for Joey, so they're called employees. I sure hope somebody's home. The people who will hopefully buy the fudge are called customers. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. The difference between the three dollars Daisy and J.R. sold the six boxes of fudge for and the 20 cents per box Joey paid them for selling it is called Joey's Gross Profit. Here's 60 cents for you, Daisy, and here's your 60 cents, J.R. However, out of the $1.80 Joey now has left, he promised to pay his mother 10 cents a box for the materials and labor involved in making the fudge, leaving him $1.20. This is called Joey's Net Profit. Boy, I never knew running a business was this tough. Now, if Joey wants to continue in the fudge business, he can either reinvest his own capital or he can go back to his mother again. He can also take his profit and forget all about the fudge business. So you see, Joey has several different options. That's one of the reasons it's called the free enterprise system. Ah, baloney. You know something, you voiceover narrators are all alike. You keep sounding off about the free enterprise system, but you're really the voiceover of big business, right? Who are you? Look, pal, don't try changing the subject on me. Free enterprise and big business are one and the same. Am I not correct? You are not correct. Free enterprise and any size business are one and the same. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then how come only big businesses don't pay taxes? Who said they don't? The record, brother, the record says right here that 40% of big business didn't pay any federal income tax last year, so how come? If you'll step aside just a moment, I'll show you. The reason 40% of big business didn't pay any taxes is because 40% of big business didn't show any profit. And if you don't show any profit, you're not required to pay a tax no matter what size you are. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, what, may I ask, do you consider profit? Profit is what's left after you subtract the cost from the selling price. Well, forget the definitions and just answer the questions. What do you consider a fair profit? 10, maybe 15 percent? Or is it even more than that? You better look at the record, my friend, because it's not 15 percent, no? not 10 percent, huh? not 9, huh? 8, hey. 7, hey. or even 6. Hey. As a matter of fact, over a period of the last 20 years, the average profit for all major corporations in the United States was just 5.4 percent. All right, hey, hey, I, like hold it, hold it. Who are you? Like I'm a friend of his, you know. Another freelance agitator? Look, pal, I don't like voiceover narrators to begin with, you know. Now, are you going to answer my question or not? I didn't hear you ask a question. Well, I am now, so listen. Like, how come we don't do like the Russians or the Chinese and let the government take all the risk, you yeah, know? Yeah, 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 how come? Well, we could, except how much are you and your friend willing to give up in order to have government take all the risk? Oh, yeah? Like, who says we have to give up anything? Yeah, yeah, L like what, for instance? Oh, like 75% of your paycheck, 90% of your roads, 85% of your automobiles, 87% of your telephones, and most of your freedom of choice. So, like, what's so great about having a freedom of choice? Oh, absolutely nothing. That is, if you've never had it. Fortunately for us, though, our nation was built on the concept that each man has the right to at least try to do what he thinks is best for himself. Yeah, but like that was yesterday when we were small, man, small. Today we're big, man, big, you know? So? Has bigness affected our freedom of choice? Don't we simply have a greater variety of options available to us? Go to any supermarket today. Go to the dog food counter. How many choices do you have? 
or drive along the street looking for a place to spend the night? How many motels do you have from which to choose? How many doctors, sports attractions, television sets, bicycles, congressmen, soft drinks, aspirin, gasoline, frozen dinners, okay, shaving creams? Okay, okay, all right, all right. Let's say you made your point. Not that you have, mind you, but let's say you have. Now, supposing I'm just a little guy working for a big company. I mean, like all they care about is what's good for the company, right? I agree. Too many people are becoming anonymous faces in a crowd, and that bothers me. Simply producing more than anyone else also bothers me. Because what's important is more of what, and for what purpose, and what will it mean when we get it, and what are we giving up? Right on, brother, right on. You talk about too many anti-mominous faces, but the big reason they're anti-mominous is because what some people are sending other people ain't receiving. You're absolutely right. Of course I'm right. I, um, I, what did you say? I said you're absolutely right. We're not doing a good job of communicating with each other. Communication can only take place between people with a common aim, a common problem, a common curiosity, and a common interest. Yeah, but that's the problem. What's common to you ain't necessarily common to us. Yeah, like are you trying to tell us that the free enterprise system actually cares about what's good or bad for guys like me? I'm telling you that the free enterprise system had better care about what's good or bad for guys like you. Or it's a dead duck. Hey, somebody said the secret word. If we may continue. I was saying a strong and healthy free enterprise system can only stay that way as long as it gives in direct proportion to what it takes. The key word, though, is free. Free from dominance by management. Free from dominance by labor. And free from dominance by government. Yeah, but wait a minute. I mean, like, somebody's got to make the rules. Make the rules, yes. But not dominate, not control, and not excessively tax. Uh, what do you mean by that? Did you know that there are 116 taxes on a suit of clothes, 151 on a loaf of bread, and 101 on a single egg? <laughs> oh, you're putting me on. I wish I were. The average citizen works from January 1st until June 1st just to pay his federal, state, and local taxes. Hey, like, if I read you right, brother, is what you're trying to say that the cost and control of government is getting a little out of hand? If you'll step back again, I'll try to illustrate my point. Oh, yeah, excuse me. Uh, is this the proper distance? That's fine. Uh, not too many years ago, the Department of Agriculture spent a considerable amount of money to supposedly save the family farmer. Today, there are only a third as many family farmers but there are three times as many employees in the Department of Agriculture. Amazing. He's full of statistics. Here's another example. For 50 years, the railroads of our country have been getting deeper and deeper into trouble because of unrealistic regulations. Finally, their situation became so desperate, the government took over. And the very first thing it did was to exempt itself from obeying those same regulations the railroads have been complaining about for 50 years. Hold it, hold it! You mean you think there should be no government controls at all? I most certainly do not. Government has many legitimate and worthwhile functions, and it performs most of them exceedingly well. Well, I got one question to ask you. What's that? Like this whole thing we've been talking about, the free enterprise system. Will it really work? It has to work. But this much I know. If it is to work, it must stop labeling one side owner and the other side occupant. One side big and the other side small. One side rich and the other side poor. One side establishment and the other side anti-establishment. If it doesn't, it hasn't a chance. It must be just, it must be equitable, and it must be free. Hey. Can I ask just one last thing? Well, sure. Go ahead. Where do we go from here? Well, that depends on how much we care. Those of us who learn from our own experience will be wise. Those who learn from the experience of others will be happy. But those of us who learn neither from our own experience or the experience of others will be fools. I don't want to be no fool. So can I. Ab, uh, tell me something. 
As a freelance constructive agitator, who do you think did the best job? Me or my friend? I think you both did extremely well. Um, how do you think I did as a voiceover narrator? Well, to tell you the truth, uh, like, I didn't like you at all in the beginning, but uh, you kind of grew on me, you know what I mean? Hey, I got an idea. Next time, you'll be the freelance constructive agitator, and we'll be the voiceover narrator. That's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it is oh, dumb. It is dumb. It is. Minister to France, Thomas Jefferson, was returning home on a six months leave of absence. The overland trip from Paris to Le Havre took about a week. After waiting ten days for favorable winds, he crossed the channel and waited ten more days in the port of Cowes. On the 23rd of October, he cleared port arriving at Norfolk in Virginia only 29 days later. There he learned that he'd been appointed two months earlier to the newly created office of Secretary of State. His was the task of representing a new republic in an old world. A world with no world problems in which peoples of different cultures and languages had little contact Transportation was slow and costly, and the average person lived and died where he was born. The great majority of the people were subsistence farmers, using the same crude methods and simple tools as centuries of men before them had used. They planted little and harvested less. In a good year, they would load their produce on a wagon made by the local Cartwright and journey into the town market. For the merchant, the cobbler, the wheelwright and the weaver traded their wares, buttons and boots, watches and cotton cloth. These were costly goods for common people. Things were much the same in Brussels, Nizhny Novgorod, and Nanking. Battles were fought by a few professional soldiers. three miles. That's the way it was, the way it always had been, and the way it would always be. How did this happen? What great changes occurred to transform human relationships in the 150 years since Thomas Jefferson? But what we do affects people on the other side of the earth, and what they do vitally affects us. The answer to these questions 
begin in modern productive power. Power in coal. Power in falling water. Power in oil. The work done by one man in a day can be equaled by a small motor using less than a pint of gasoline. Oil furnishing power for use in agricultural machinery has multiplied agricultural production per man and released millions of workers for industry. Mechanical efficiency has made possible the cultivation of crops over vast areas so that four great concentrated wheat belts provide bread for the world. Energy in one pound of coal develops power equal to a man's physical labor in eight hours. And one man can mine 10,000 pounds of coal in a day. Coal fed to the locomotives of the 214-mile Bessemer and Lake Erie Railroad enables 2,600 employees to do the work of 10 million laborers. Whenever machinery is replaced and assisted the muscles of men and animals, production per man has been stepped up astronomically, making possible the endless manufacture of all types of goods to meet men's needs everywhere. Until a century ago, communication between peoples of different lands and cultures was limited by slow means of travel. Today, there are more telephone conversations crossing the Atlantic between New York and London than there were letters exchanged in the United States in 1790. And the journey that took Thomas Jefferson over two months can be made in less than a day. Fully as important as the increase in speed of travel and communication has been the revolutionary decrease in the cost of transport. It costs as much to carry a given amount of goods 125 miles by porter as it does to haul it 250 miles by cart. For the same cost, it can be transported 150 miles by plane and 1,000 miles by truck. By rail, it can be moved 2,500 miles and around the world by modern ocean freighter. As one country after another picked up the tempo of industry, this low-cost transportation opened new areas of supply for raw materials and new markets for manufactured goods. Rubber, tin, tungsten, cobalt, chromium. All these became vital to the production of everyday needs. People wanted simple things. Leisure, conveniences, relief from back and spirit breaking work. They got it. But in looking for goods and exchanging gadgets, people everywhere have brought themselves much closer together. Tin production in Malaya vitally affects the miners in Bolivia and also factory workers in Baltimore. Failure of a wheat crop in Australia affects market prices in Chicago, Buenos Aires, Liverpool. But with the new industry and commerce binding the world into one entity, there have been born vast world problems. Attempts to deal with them on a local scale have proved futile. Staggering physical powers have been harnessed by war-minded nations. The bodies and minds of entire populations are targets in total wars, which threaten civilization itself. We didn't plan it this way. 
But the world of human relationships has been transformed by science. Contacts of individuals and of nations have been enormously expanded and multiplied. World encircling problems have been created. How can we hope to solve them unless we tackle them together with courage and determination, dedicating the new powers to the benefit of all mankind? Yes, to be a successful service station dealer, you must know your customer. Know all the different personalities, likes and dislikes that go to make up your average customer. It's sometimes hard to know why this customer picks your station or your competitor's station. Gee, he picked my station. He certainly did. I wonder why. Because he knows whammo gas is the best gas. Perhaps, but... What do you mean, perhaps? Everybody knows whammo's the best gas. Now, take it easy. Let's just ask him and see. Excuse me, sir. Why did you stop in this service station? To get gas, of course. What did I tell you? I beg your pardon. I mean, why did you pick this particular station? Because it's convenient. It didn't look very convenient, did it? He passed a lot of stations to get to yours. He sure did. Beats me. That's one of the discoveries about customer habits made in a nationwide survey of service station patrons. This survey was conducted for the DuPont Petroleum Chemicals Division by National Analysts Incorporated of Philadelphia. The survey consisted of interviews with thousands of customers. It was conducted by psychologists trained to question people in such a way as to determine from their answers the true reasons for buying. Sort of like detectives, eh? Exactly. These psychologists studied the responses of thousands of customers in the Northeast, South, Central, and Far Western United States. The purpose of the survey was to determine what the motorist's buying patterns are, why he buys what he buys, and where he buys it. For example, when asked, do you, Do you think, think gasoline, gasoline brands, brands are essentially, are essentially alike, alike or, or different? different? They're all the same. I think they're pretty much alike. Hardly any difference. My husband says Whammo's the best gas. Although more than three out of four said brands are much alike, this is the way they answered, What, what gasoline, gasoline do you, you buy? buy? I always buy Zippo. I always try to buy Wizzo. I buy anything. I always buy Whammo because my husband says I should. Well, I'll be darned. Yes, strange, isn't it? Three out of four customers think brands are much alike. Yet, surprisingly enough, two of these three buy one particular brand. The answer to the next question clarifies this apparent inconsistency. Where, Where do you, you buy, buy your, your gasoline? gasoline? I always trade at Jim Doherty's. He sells Zippo. I buy most of my gas from Fred Lathrop. He sells Whistle. I buy my gas anywhere. It's all a... We buy all our gas at Harry Smith's station. He proved to my husband that Whammo is the best gasoline. Madam, why do you buy all your gasoline at Harry Smith's station? Oh, it's so convenient. And you, sir, do you trade at Jim Doherty's because it's convenient? Yes, it's convenient. And besides, Jim gives me good service. Fred Lathrop Station gives me good service, and I like him and his helpers. So this is the way it stacks up so far. Three out of four customers think all gasoline is pretty much the same, brand for brand. Yet most of them buy only one brand and patronize one station because... The station is convenient. They like the dealer and his helpers. They get good service. But just as when a woman says, I think I'll go powder my nose, and really has something else in mind, 
The survey found that your customers also had reasons behind the reasons given for always patronizing the same service station. Our first motorist passed several other stations to reach his convenient station. Your station, my friend. I see what you mean. When a motorist says convenient, he doesn't necessarily mean close by. Jim Doherty's station is convenient and he gives me good service. What's the reason behind the reason? It's, it's easy, easy to, to drive, drive into, into Jim's station, station and he, he takes, takes care, care of it promptly. He, he always senses when I'm in a hurry and doesn't, doesn't waste time. time. He not only wipes my windshield, but also checks the tires, the radiator, and even the battery without my asking. He takes an interest in me and my car. I like that. Fred Lathrop's station always gives me good service. Besides, I like Fred. He always takes the time to give me a good lube job. I never get brushed off. His helpers are friendly and cheerful. Not like those birds down the street at that fizzle station. I went there once and they spilled gas all over the fender, didn't wipe my windshield, didn't even know which side of the engine the dipstick was on. I'd walk before I'd buy a gallon of that fizzle gas anywhere. Harry Smith Station is so convenient. I always feel comfortable there. It's the only service station I've ever been in where I didn't feel out of place. Whenever he does anything to the car, Harry explains it in such a way I can tell my husband about it. And all his helpers are so courteous and clean. You know, she reminds me of one of my customers. What the survey really found out was that when a customer said a station was convenient, he meant he felt comfortable in the station. The owner and helpers took a personal interest in him and treated his car with respect, whether it was old or new. It was easy to get in and out of the station. He knew he could get good lubrication service there. When he said, I like the dealer and his helpers, he meant they were courteous and friendly, but they didn't overdo it. They treated his car with care. There was no slamming of the hood, no spilling of gas. They knew their job and performed it capably. When he said, they give me good service, he meant, they give me the expected service without my asking for it. That is, cleaning the windshield, checking the oil, the radiator, tires, and battery. They notice other things about my car, such as battery corrosion, excessive tire wear or frayed fan belt. Their service is prompt. If I let them know I'm in a hurry, they never waste my time. Maybe I should have psychologists as my station helpers. In a way, successful station owners and their helpers are good psychologists. They sense what the customer wants and needs. This was shown by another fact the survey uncovered. It was found also that all motorists have hidden anxieties, and this is important. I wonder if they really did put five quarts of oil in the crankcase. I wonder if they screwed that drain plug in tight. They did that lubrication job so quickly. I wonder if they got all of it fitted. I hope they fixed that tire right. I'd hate to get a flat. A good dealer can overcome these worries by showing the customer the dipstick, remarking that the drain plug is tight, mentioning some problem and how it was solved. In general, he sends the customer away satisfied by showing, explaining, and assuring. The study shows that women present another problem to the service station dealer. You can say that again. That's because they naturally worry more about things they don't understand. I feel so out of place in a service station. I hope they won't think I'm stupid. I hope they don't tell me something I can't explain to my husband. I have so many other things to do. I hope they don't keep me here forever. Yes, women appreciate prompt service, assurance about the products they're buying, courtesy, advice about the care of their car, and above all, patience when they don't easily understand mechanical things. 
Most women follow their husband's suggestions when patronizing a station. And they feel secure when they think the dealer is doing things right. But on a trip, it's most often the wife who decides which station to stop at. She picks a station where she thinks the restrooms will be clean. Sometimes this business looks pretty complicated. Yes, but it isn't really. You see, the average motorist is a composite of all these likes, dislikes, and anxieties. In his normal day-to-day -day driving, his preferences are kind of dealer and helpers, ease of entry into the station, quality of lubrication service, price of gasoline, mechanic availability, general appearance of station, clean restrooms, credit availability, good TBA service. What about the same customer when he's away from home? On a trip, for instance. What makes him pick a station then? The DuPont survey covered that, too. Naturally, in unfamiliar surroundings, qualities that were down the list in importance in a familiar service station near his home go toward the top of the list when a motorist is on a long trip. Clean restrooms, ease of station entry, general appearance of station, price of gasoline, type of dealer, mechanic availability, TBA and service, credit availability, quality of lubrication service. To summarize, the three most important preferences are day-to-day, -day, kind of dealer and helpers, ease of entry into the station, quality of lubrication service. On trips, clean restrooms, ease of station entry, general appearance of the station. Well, the psychologists dug out enough facts about what the customer likes in the station. It seems to me that how they feel about dealers is pretty important, too. You're right. All of the thousands of customers interviewed had very definite ideas as to what made a good dealer. They listed their preference in this order. Promptness of service, checking oil and water, careful treatment of the car, friendliness, cleaning windshield without being asked, knowledge of cars, care in putting in gasoline, clean appearance. Hey, where are you going? I've got a customer out there at the Pup Island, and I don't want to keep him waiting. Good for you. From all this, we see that good dealers and their Pump Island salesmen are the best business builders of all. They put the customer at ease, and he keeps coming back because he feels at home and gets personalized attention for himself and his car. So remember, to be successful, you must Know your customer. I'll tell you what's wrong with this organization. Communications, that's what's wrong. Send a memo. From now on, people around here have got to communicate better. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Communications in this organization uh, are going to be straightened out at once. Every section head is, um, is responsible for uh, doing an immediate survey in depth. What is it? I don't know. Something's wrong with the company's communication setup. Oh. So this memo came down from the office, and it said we should all talk to each other more, and, and when Mr. Sawyer asked me what I needed, I told him a powder blue telephone would make my desk just perfect. So next week, they're going to start putting in... A whole new telephone system? But I didn't want a whole new telephone system. I didn't say that. I didn't mean that. I meant communications, communications, communications! That's right. Communications. Not just sending a cable or a wire, not public speaking, not writing a letter, nor watching TV or a movie, but something much less obvious. Communications between human beings. A constant creation of understanding between people. 
is always a sender and always a receiver. You hope. And ideas or feelings or facts to establish between them. As a communicator, you have to get through to people. First, to be understood. To get something across to somebody so he or she knows exactly what you mean. It can be a policy change or a change of schedule. Or it can be your intentions or feelings in the form of correction. Or your frame of mind in the form of almost anything. The second communication objective is to be accepted. To get people to agree with you. Or at least give your communication a hearing. The third objective is action. To get something done. So your communication affects performance. Improves it. You get action because the receiver understands what you want done, why he or she should do it. There's a fourth communications objective, to understand others, to know how they feel about a particular situation or conditions in general, to be aware of how they feel about you. A communication isn't just something that goes from you to others, it's something that takes place between you and others. Sure, this is how you communicate, with words. With some people, you've got to write the words every time because they believe only what they see. But some people only half read what you write or are too busy to read what you write. So these people, you always have to tell. With others, you have to combine methods. You tell and you write. You can communicate with some people over the telephone and they'll understand. But with others, you have to be more personal. They have to see you to understand. The method of communication can sometimes determine the effectiveness of the communication itself. Sure, the method of communication varies and you have to keep choosing, knowing when a personal visit is better than calling over the telephone when a written communication is better than a spoken one. Obviously, you can't pay a personal visit across the country or over the ocean every time you want to communicate a change in plans. Several things determine your choice in method. Subject matter, cost, and time are important. Time in the sense of which method will get the thought, fact, or idea across quickly. And time in the sense of when is the best time to put the method to work. Let's call this timing, knowing when to communicate. Now, some people just won't hear you if they're busy doing something else. You communicate, and the ear hears it. I'd appreciate it very much. But there's something else that hears you. I made it my foot, just making it tough for me. So he'll catch me in another mistake. Sometimes the heart hears something quite different because people feel, you know, not just once in a while, but every second, every beat. They think and they feel, think, feel, think, feel, worry, impatience, conceit, nervousness, carelessness, indifference, aggressiveness, insecurity, anger, and a hundred other emotional things people are that form barriers to communications. These are what you have to plow through with each communication you send out. A frightened man thinks and feels differently from one who's secure. Communicate an order to the bold, aggressive kind of person. A big account possibility just broke. It's a tough nut to crack, but I'd like you to go out right away and handle it. It all depends on you, boy. You bet, Bob. I'll get right after it. Well, these same words might be received in an entirely different way by a less experienced, more fearful man. A big account possibility just broke. It's a tough nut to crack, but I'd like you to go out right away. Gee. I don't have to handle something like that. What if I mess it up? All by myself? Oh, I can't handle that. On the other hand, 
with understanding of Paul's emotional barriers and a little sensitivity. A terrific opportunity, and I know you can handle it. It's similar to the Appleby account you sold last week. Come to me if you need help. Remember, we're with you. I'll get right after it. Sure, the same communication can be wrongly received because of the attitudes, the personalities, the barriers inside people. Sometimes the same words mean different things to different people. Henry, what did the... You told me to do a model job, and I worked hard on it. Believe me, a more perfect model you won't get. But we needed... I didn't mean a model. I meant a model job, a perfect job, a good job, a real job. But that's not what you said. Don't listen to what I say, listen to what I mean. Well, you can't always be certain of how people think or feel or what they know. That's why it often pays off to plan for communication. Before you pick up the telephone or write a memo or go out personally to communicate, run through some basic steps that might knock down some of the communication barriers. What? What are you going to communicate? A fact, an order, information, an attitude? Why? Why is it important? Why did the problem arise? Why is the communication necessary? How? How should you explain it? Orally, in writing, or both? Should you do it in your own office or out on the floor? When? When is the timing right? For you, for him or her? Can it wait? Should you take care of it now? Who? Who is the person you're communicating with? Do you know his personality, her attitude? Have you examined his point of view? Do you understand her needs? And of course, once you add everything up, you've got to watch the language barrier. Now, you remember, Miss Rowan, the first page of the Fratus has got to have the fortress pad included, and uh, don't forget the Friedel wasp. A little over-communications can put the receiver mentally to sleep. Now, I know this is taking a long time, Murrow, but it's important to get all the details, and I want to go over a few more points on item 26. You see, what I think should be done in this instance is to take what we can call a long-term look at the project. That is, I mean, we've always got to look ahead and plan. You can under-communicate, too. Higgins, I've got to rush out. Order came in from Highland Company. Take care of it. Uh, tell me how you came out later, okay? Who's Highland Company? You see what I think should be done... In the Matter of fact, if you don't keep your language simple and clear, you can make people not want to communicate back. And this two-way communications, this feeding back, is important no matter where you sit on the management line. But you don't only communicate with your voice. There are unspoken communications that often speak much louder than words. And often unthought of communications. You watch for them in the receiver, and he watches for them in you. Maybe they don't communicate too loudly when you isolate them like this. But in a given circumstance, these unspoken communications can often change the meaning of words. Rogers, it's imperative that this assignment be completed fast. Understand? Everybody's got to pitch in and get this job out fast. Now, I want you gentlemen to leave this meeting with the realization that in this organization, people are our most valuable asset. Sure, come in, Wilson. Door's always open. Always got time to talk to one of my people. Oh, Helen, come in. I wanted to talk to you about something. It's come to my attention that you've been violating a company policy. And I want to remind you about it and issue a preliminary warning. There's absolutely no smoking on the job. Sure, your feet, your hands, your eyes, your face, and your heart reflect your attitude. And your attitude builds the climate, the atmosphere in which you and your people work. 
a basic natural climate of fairness, honesty, and mutual respect that keeps the communication lines clear and open both ways. So people know always where they stand with you. And you know where you stand with them. John Jones, who is surely a hero. Without him, our future is practically zero. Why does John rate so from East Coast to West? John Jones is a guy with some bucks to invest. A few million John Joneses are really essential for our nation to meet its future potential. Between now and 1975, we'll spend an amount quite nifty. To replace old plants and machinery, 200 billions, plus 50. While to build new plants to provide the jobs and machinery for added millions, we'll need still more, an amount, in fact, of some 600 billions. Put them together and you've got a figure that isn't exactly hay and explains why industry has such need for lots of cash today. Since a good many companies can't get all they need only from what they're earning, for the money to grow, more and more of them to the John J. Joneses keep turning. But you can't attract those bucks of his by simply waiting and wishing. To get them, in fact, you'll have to face considerable competition. I've got the dough and I'm ready to go, but I'm one boy, you've got the show. For the investor market is not unlike a midway at the fair, with different barkers telling why John should spend his money there. Right this way, friends, the greatest attraction on the pike. Uranium Gold Dust Incorporated. A penny today gives you a dollar tomorrow. And it's the only stock on the market that glows in the dark. Here you are, young man, invest with us. Give us your dollars and forget about them. American West Indian Balloon is going up. Up! Blue sky stuff is all very fine, but security is a concern of mine. Security, Mr. Jones. Now you're talking our language. Your account is always welcome at City Savings and Loan. 4% on your money. That's $4 on every hundred, you know. And your account is insured. If it's safety you want, my good man, you'll find it here. A bank, Mr. Jones, is the place to save. And Fourth National welcomes your account. If you invest with us, you bank on your future. Insurance, Mr. Jones. For the long run or the short run, consider insurance. It's truly a premium investment, and I assure you, when it comes to security, ours is the best policy. Buy bonds, Mr. Jones. An investment in government bonds is an investment in the nation itself. The point of security is most assuring, but to get good dividends is also alluring. Dividends? Did you say dividends? Step this way, partner, and get the facts. Son, you just give a little thought to the business of liquid gold, that beautiful black stuff that makes the world go round. Dividends? Let me show you what's happened to dividends in our little old ever-loving business in the last few years. In 1945, we paid our $5 dividend. Last year, we paid a $12 dividend. Yankee money, too. The more we earn, the more dividends we pay. No, sir, we don't fool around in the oil business. Down, boy. To have good dividends like yours is really great, I know. But uh, what about a formula to make my money grow? Formulas are my business, Mr. Jones. Invest in chemicals. We've got the formula for making your money make money. Here's how it works. If you had given us $100 for chemical stock in 1945, with our system of making high profits and pouring them back into the business, you would have $300 worth in today's market. That's all very well for appreciation, but what of the problems that come with inflation? If inflation's your worry, 
Invest with us, Mr. Jones. Put your money in a business that's close to the people. In times of inflation, we raise our prices to keep our profits in line. Invest in merchandising, Mr. Jones. When our costs go up, we suit our prices to the need. Hard goods is the buy, Mr. Jones. When our manufacturing costs rise, we raise our prices to ensure our investors adequate returns. Build your future with the building business, brother. When labor and material costs go up, and it costs us more to do business, we adjust our prices accordingly. To keep up with inflation, you may have ability, but I'm also concerned with some surefire stability. Stability, Brother Jones. Now you're plugged in on the right circuit. The stock of power utilities is your buy, my good friend. Now those dollars you have to invest didn't come easy. So naturally, you want stability. And right here is where you'll find it. I'll show you why. Take a look at what's happened to a lot of other stocks in unregulated companies through the years. They've gone up and they've gone down. Then up, then down. Then up and tomorrow, who knows where. Now, most of our stocks, on the other hand, in the power utilities, have had a sure but steady rise. And what's more, brother, we have a long history of remaining in business. In a word, my friend, stability. As to dividends, well, it's true, our earnings are controlled by public service commissioners. And I'll level with you, brother, at times, we may have been held back from earning as much as we felt was justified. But we've paid regular dividends, my friend. Paid them like clockwork, year after year after year. And they've gone up some, too. So plug in on power utilities, brother. We've got your stability, regular dividends, and we grow as the country grows. With so many choices, I'm in the position of finding it hard to make a decision. Invest in missiles and electronics, Mr. Jones. Buy yourself a ticket to tomorrow. We're leaving for the moon in 30 seconds. Right this way, son, Uranium Gold Dust Incorporated. If it's safety you want, my good man, you'll find it here. We don't fool around in the oil business, son. Dividends, we pour them out. We've got the formula for making your money make money. In times of inflation, we raise our prices to keep our profits in line. Plug in on power utilities, brother. We've got your stability, regular dividends, and we grow as the country grows. When they raise their prices, we raise them. Yes, Mr. Jones, it's really a problem for anyone with cash to invest. To make up his mind with so many choices, just which investment is best? And one thing concerns us here and now, and to seek the answers, we'll try to find out just how you do decide, Mr. John J. Jones, and why. Have you ever asked yourself what makes a country strong? Good question. How we've traveled so far on a road that was so long. Here's the answer. It's happened milk and vegetables and corn for the feed. It happened wool and cup and cattle for the meat. With 80 million eggs growing solid weed. But it takes more than that to make a country strong. It's the finest of machinery and the power to work the land. The finest kind of man to do the you job at hand. It's a freedom to sow. It's a freedom to grow. It's a freedom to travel. A man may want to go. And on the land those arrive from the road. 
Meet Larry Evans, an active partner in America's big farming. His success is based on a simple formula. Power means production. More power means more friction. He takes his power for granted. It's always there when he needs it. Hard to imagine doing without it. But it wasn't always there. The power that Larry Adams takes for granted represents ages of progress. And so does Larry Adams. Together, they tell the story of man's struggle to make the land and nature work for him. Oh, we don't know for sure how the struggle began, but life was mighty hard for the prehistoric man. He had to feed himself and his family some way. Oh, none of us would be around enjoying life today. This was one way of getting food. However, it had its drawbacks. The food supply wouldn't always cooperate. It was often a long time between meals. He had to find a way to get food when he wanted it. What he needed was more strength, added power, a weapon. Aya! But even in those days, there were scoffers, people with a thousand ways of saying no. Ah, uh, why wear your arm out with that thing? It'll never work. There's only one way to get meat. But man was not to be discouraged. Armed with a weapon, he became a hunter. As time passed, man improved his weapons. He became a skillful hunter. Too skillful, animals became scarce. To stay alive, man had to migrate from place to place, always on the move. Not the sort of life a man would choose, but if he was to go on eating, he had to keep following the food supply. Maybe he did have a choice after all. Yes, he saw the chance to have a permanent home. Not the scoffer. He wasn't falling for any harebrained ideas. He'd go on wandering the rest of his life. But man and his family clung together bravely. Somehow, they managed to survive. When spring came, their courage was rewarded. Man went to work building up his reward. And made an interesting observation, which eventually led him to discover how plants grow seeds buried in the ground, water, and sun, germination, and growth. Little by little, man learned how to work the land. Later, he developed the first crude plow. Now, he was his own master, no longer just living, but making a living. Man had become a farmer. He passed the biggest barriers of that early day With many a road to hoe as yet, but he was on his way He had freedom to sow, to expand and to grow And the man on the land knew where he was going to go With a dependable food supply, population increased Families began living together in communities These were the beginnings of civilization some men developed other skills. Trading began. The best farmer got the best of the trade, which encouraged him to produce more and better crops. But there was a limit to what he could produce with the available power. This led to another great discovery. It'll never work. We've gone as far as we can go. 
man disagreed. In the centuries that followed, his inventiveness carried him much farther and much faster. He traded with other communities, with other nations. Wherever man brought abundance from the land and was free to trade, civilization advanced. Early civilizations arose and were succeeded by others. One of the greatest was the Roman Empire. When Rome fell, Europe entered the Dark Ages. Law and order gave way to force of arms. To survive, farmers had to buy protection from local warlords. The price was their freedom. The farmer was now a serf, lowest caste in the social order, no longer working for himself, held in bondage by the noble on the hill. A man without freedom is a man bound fast. A man who is bound to the drudgery of the past. He don't dare speak up or call his soul his own. And the burden in his heart is like a load of stone. For centuries, there was almost no change in the farmer's way of life. And yet, man kept alive the dream of freedom. Finally, word came of a new world where a man could be his own master. Many traveled the long road to freedom. It meant going back for a time to a primitive, dangerous life. But here, they were free to speak, think, and worship as they wished. Here, man had a chance to grow and get ahead an opportunity that shaped the future of the American farmer. When his freedom was threatened, he refused to knuckle under. He liked his independence and he wanted to be free. But they told him to be loyal to a land across the sea. So he wrote a declaration, then defied them all. He oiled his gun and waited for the trumpet to call. That's what it takes to make a country strong. A man on the land who knows the right from the wrong. There were scoffers in America, too. Hey, why do you want independence? Why don't you just do what they tell you? The man at Concord chose independence. He fought and won. It was his land and worth fighting for, a land with a promise. For many a farmer, the promise led him off over the horizon. He kept pushing the boundaries westward as population increased. More people meant more mouths to feed, more land to feed them. The farmer needed more power, horsepower, horse-drawn machinery. Still, it wasn't enough. He doubled, tripled, quadrupled the horsepower until feeding his work animals took a large part of his land, labor, and time. His whole life was a race against time. At the end of the day, his energy was totally used up. He had to find another source of power. As always, the scoffer was on hand. Ha, <laughs> who ever heard of plowing that way? <laughs> Don't you know when you lick? Still, the farmer kept trying. So did others. The patent office was bombarded with schemes and devices. <laughs> oh, world's, world's full of lunatics. You take those fellas over in Pennsylvania, punching a hole in the ground to get oil. Well, what good is it? You can burn it in a lamp, but that's all. Oh, oh, oh. They think they think that thing will run on oil? Huh. Probably tell you next, they'll put wheels on it and make it go. Oh, they think it'll pull a plow. It'll never work. The whole idea will blow up sky high. Wrong again. Here, blowing sky high was power to revolutionize man's way of life. For the farmer, power to run the tractor, outperforming any number of work animals. And no crops required to feed it. 
A nationwide race began to meet the demand for oil. North, south, east, west, they searched the country round, wherever liquid power was hidden underground. Power enough for every need, power enough to last, power enough to build a future brighter than the past. Hundreds of companies were formed, little and big, all competing for a share of the business. Machine manufacturers were also in competition to build cheaper, more efficient tractors and other kinds of farm machinery. Petroleum-powered vehicles of all sorts, trucks to haul farm products to market on roads converted from dust to asphalt by petroleum. As farms became more mechanized, more and more farm products flowed to market. Farmers cultivated many times more land, raised many times more crops per man acre than ever before. And over the years, everyone has shared in the benefits. For progress is a stepping stone to a better life. And everyone can share it with the farmer and his wife. There's time to relax, to get around, and once more, time to do a better job than ever before. Yes, time to keep up with the latest information from the county agent and land-grant colleges. The wide-awake farmer keeps improving his crops and stock. For there's keen rivalry among farmers. Each year they supply the public with better products. And they demand the same from the industries that supply them. More and better insecticides, weed killers, fertilizers. Better lubricants to protect machinery against the wear and tear of friction. And continually better fuels. The demand for oil products keeps increasing. There are always scoffers. Uh-uh. You're heading for trouble. Pretty soon there won't be any oil left. Wrong again. New techniques are even bringing old wells back to life. New fields are being opened up all over the world. New drilling methods to tap oil pools miles underground. Better refining. New techniques to conserve every drop of oil. As it has in the past, America's oil industry, made up of thousands of privately managed competing companies, will continue to supply the power we need. Power for the farmer to accomplish a job that's now worldwide in scope. For today, American food reaches half the seaports of the world, helping those nations whose future is linked with our own. The American farmer has come a long way in his struggle to make the land and nature work for him. But tomorrow promises even greater abundance. Abundance created by the free American man on the land in partnership with American industry and its power. Together, they will work to ensure our strength and preserve our climate of freedom. Your freedom like you cultivate your land. You guard against its enemies on each and every hand. You keep yourself awake and you're ready to fight. To suffice the things you have for what you know is right. That's what it takes to make a country strong. A man on the land who knows the right from the wrong.